everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Ellen Nakashima, a national security reporter with the Washington Post, and I'm excited to be moderating today's program. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by John Brennan, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and author of the new bestseller, Undaunted, My Fight Against America's Enemies at Home and Abroad. With a total of 29 years at the CIA and four at the White House, Mr. Brennan has spent the bulk of his career in public service, from an analyst on Near Eastern and South Asian issues to serving as Director George Tenet's Chief of Staff, to heading the National Counterterrorism, Counterterrorism Center, and ultimately to working directly with President Barack Obama as Homeland Security Advisor and then his CIA Director. John Brennan has rare breadth and depth of experience. His book, Undaunted, offers a rich personal perspective on the world of intelligence and national security and on Washington's chaotic political environment. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. So thank you, John, for joining us. Let, let's start with your title, Undaunted. What's the significance behind it? What prompted you to write the memoir you said you never intended to write? Well, Ellen, first of all, thank you for moderating this event today, and I want to extend my appreciation to the Commonwealth Club <clears throat> for sponsoring it. Um, you know, and Daunted uh, was my memoir, my first and so far only book that I wrote. And uh, I decided to uh, put down my experiences, my recollections about my 33-plus years in government uh, as a way to uh, lift the shroud a bit uh, off of the intelligence and national security environment, which is filled with mystique to a lot of people, but also, and I think more importantly, to encourage young Americans to seriously consider a career in public service, whether it be in the intelligence community or the diplomatic corps or law enforcement. This is a great, wonderful country of ours, and I'd like to think that most Americans want to give back to this country and to do what they can to help ensure that we remain free and safe and prosperous and do what they can to protect their fellow citizens. So uh, I'd like to think that the, the book will be read by young Americans and maybe it will entice them to pursue uh, a, an application and a career in public service. Uh, the title, Undaunted, um, it's, a, it's a combination of things. Um, I, I reference uh, in the, the memoir times when uh, there were strong headwinds uh, blowing uh, toward me. Um, that uh, I tried to persevere, and uh, I guess most recently, over the last four years, when I have been a bit uh, outspoken, and despite the efforts of some to try to uh, stifle my voice, uh, I like to think I have remained undaunted. But also during the course of my national security career, uh, there were times and, and uh, setbacks and challenges um, that I uh, faced, um, but I really believe strongly in the national security mission and the intelligence mission. And uh, despite some of concerns I had about some of the things that maybe the United States was involved in or over the course of its history, as well as uh, during my tenure, um, I, I remained undaunted in terms of uh, being committed and dedicated to uh, that, those missions. That, that spirit really does come through in, in your book and in what you say. Um, but as you mentioned, you have been quite outspoken uh, fairly untraditional for a former uh, senior intelligence community leader. Uh, you have called the current administration a cacistocracy, meaning government by the least competent, uh, which has caused a surge in search online searches for that term, I guess. You've called Trump a disgraced demagogue who belongs in the dustbin of history. Do you think, in a sense, speaking out so strongly um, at times might undermine the perception of the intelligence community as an apolitical, above the fray institution? Well, I know that a lot of people have criticized my outspokenness um, because they believe that, you know, I guess once a CIA director, always a CIA director, but I have been a private citizen since January 20th of 2017. And for many years, I worked hard to protect uh, the right of freedom of speech of American citizens. So maybe now I'm reaping the benefits of, of the investment that I made in that. And I don't enjoy speaking out so publicly and stridently and, and critically as I have of an incumbent in the Oval Office. 
uh, I serve six presidents, uh, three Democrats and three Republicans. And while I didn't agree with all of their policies and had some vigorous disagreements with some of them about it, I respected and admired all of them. And I felt that they all were trying to do their level best to advance the interests of the United States and, and not their own. Um, it's different with Donald Trump. Uh, I sensed early on that uh, he was going to uh, not fulfill the obligations and responsibilities of the office of the presidency. His dishonesty, his deceit, his demagoguery, um, his lack of integrity, um, his pursuit of personal political uh, agendas, as well as other <laughs> personal agendas, whether it be financial or otherwise, I just felt was uh, a, a real aberration and, uh, and disgraceful, quite frankly. Uh, and so I felt this obligation to, to speak out, uh, as I have. And I'm not the only person to do that with a you know, former national security background, uh, Jim Clapper, uh, Mike Hayden, uh, some very respected um, former military officers as well, you know, uh, Admiral um, McRaven and others. So I think it's the abnormality <laughs> of what we are experiencing these days that have uh, led uh, me and, and other people to uh, adopt this rather public profile of, of criticism. Um, and I, I'm not a partisan, um, but I, and it's really ironic too, because I think people now think that I'm this, you know, anti-Trumper and, and uh, this democratic uh, foil, or the foil for the Democratic Party, or whatever. Uh, when I was the director of CIA under President Obama, uh, most of those uh, in Congress who were calling for my firing or resignation were on the Democratic side of the aisle. So uh, as I think I referenced in the memoir, I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> I tend to speak my mind and speak as forthrightly as I can. And maybe I'm not as politically sensitive or attuned as maybe some people would like me to be. But uh, if I irritate uh, some because of my outspokenness, well, so be it. So it's a little refreshing, <laughs> but and it may be actually so you're saying in an ideal world, you won't you wouldn't have to speak out. Uh, well, right, because uh, I'm now retired for f yeah. nearly four years. So this is my second retirement. I guess I failed at my first retirement, but I was retired for three years after my first 25 years at CIA. And I didn't speak out critically at that time. Um, against the president. In fact, I had uh, drafted, I mentioned in the memoir, an anecdote that I, I drafted a, an op-ed where I was going to take issue with uh, President George W. Bush's uh, Saturday morning address where I thought he was unfairly uh, making a connection between Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Al-Qaeda. And I, I drafted up an op-ed and I was prepared to send it into uh, one of the newspapers uh, for publication. But then I realized it was the week before the election this was the 2006 midterm elections. And I didn't want to be perceived in any way as trying to influence uh, public perceptions uh, of the, the party or the vote or whatever. So I, I never submitted uh, that uh, the draft. So I, I really um, wish I hadn't had uh, the need to speak out. But again, there's, I guess there's something inside of me. Uh, maybe it's part Jersey, maybe it's part Irish. Uh, but <laughs> I... I, I there are times in my career in the past where I, I really felt badly for not speaking up and out. And uh, I, I try not to have any sins of omission uh, on my, my record now. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about your, your, um, your background and your experiences. As a good Irish Catholic boy growing up in New Jersey, you thought you wanted to be a priest, maybe indeed the first American pope. And why not, right? So what, <laughs> what drew you to intelligence work in the first place and to the CIA? And, and then, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, um, I grew up in a very, very devout, religious Catholic household. And that's why I was wanting to be priest and the first American pope. But uh, that uh, aspiration sort of fell by the wayside when I got into high school for a variety of reasons. Um, but I, I had the opportunity um, in my college years uh, to uh, travel overseas. Um, my cousin was a... Uh, working with the Department of State and with the Agency for International Development in Indonesia. And in the summer of my freshman year of college, I spent the summer over there uh, doing a paper on oil and politics in Indonesia. And it really opened my eyes to this big, wide, beautiful world of ours. And uh, it allowed me to also just realize just how special the United States of America is um, and all of the benefits that we have, you know, in living in the United States. Then in my junior year of college, I went to the American University in Cairo 
and uh, started my my study of Arabic as well as uh, my introduction to Middle East politics. And that uh, those two experiences really um, stimulated my interest and intellectual curiosity in the world. And so, uh, when I was in graduate school, or um, I sent in an application to the CIA. Um, I had all, also um, was looking at the diplomatic corps. I wanted to go into the Department of State and to be a, a diplomat. The CIA offered me a job, um, and I felt that it was going to give me the opportunity to continue my worldwide experiences, travel, and to learn a lot more about um, you know the United States, our place in the world. But also one of the things that was very formative for me was that I am the son of an immigrant. Uh, my father emigrated from Ireland in 1948 when he was 28 years old and always instilled in my siblings and I uh, a very, very strong sense of um, how special it is to be an American citizen and never take that citizenship for granted. And so the idea of public service and again, giving back to this country of ours I, was in my mind. So when I decided I wasn't going to you know, be part of the Catholic Church hierarchy, I decided that I was going to try to do what I could to uh, uh, pursue a career in public service. But you chose that branch of public service that's on the dark side, the secret side, as opposed to, say, the over-diplomatic side. Um, and, and some people have a view of the intelligence world, intelligence community, as something scary, secret, and dark, and sometimes that does nefarious things. How, how did your experiences um, as first like a Near East analyst, maybe as a liaison officer in Saudi or any of your other experiences shape your understanding of the role of intelligence, its positive role of intelligence in protecting American national security? Well, I joined the agency in 1980 and uh, the agency was already over 30 years uh, old at that time. And so it had been involved in a number of controversies throughout the course of the previous decades. And so I, I joined the CIA with my eyes wide open that uh, the CIA may have been and may continue to be involved in some things that I would have some personal objections to. But I, I entered the agency with an open mind. Um, when I joined the agency, I was in the operations directorate. Now, this is the part of the agency that uh, trains what's called case officers to go out around the world and to recruit spies uh, who conduct espionage against their countries. Well, within the first year of my CIA employment, I realized that I was really not cut out for that type of work because I just I found that uh, I couldn't um, adopt false personas. I, I couldn't you know, cultivate relationships that really requires one to be, I guess, rather creative <laughs> in uh, how they explain their their work. And so then I moved over to the analytic side. Uh, which was a tremendous experience for me, a wonderful experience. And in fact, early on in my analytic career, I had the opportunity to serve a rotation with the Department of State. And so I was posted in Saudi Arabia in the early 1980s as a State Department political officer. It, and it was a full rotation. So mm -hmm. I got to understand what life is like uh, working in an embassy, uh, the role of political officers, and, and how the different parts of the U.S. government work together overseas to advance and protect our national security interests. And through the course of my CIA career then, uh, I bounced back and forth between analysis and, and operations and, and, and management. And there were things that I saw that I very much admired, uh, the guile, the, the risk-taking, the, the courage, uh, the intellect of uh, CIA officers. But there were also things that I saw that really made me uh, quite concerned about the types of things that maybe CIA officers were involved in. And so I felt that my... Uh, Certainly my first 25 years in the CIA was the opportunity for me to gain as much experience and knowledge as possible about the importance of CIA's work, but also uh, the things that I felt needed to be strengthened and, and those things that maybe needed to be uh, more limited in terms of uh, what the CIA was involved in. In fact, there's a tension that emerges in your book between your call them Catholic morals, and, and, and the cold, hard realities of, of keeping America safe from its enemies. The clearest example, I think you're, you maybe alluded to it, is the CIA's wow. role in the rendition, detention, and interrogation program, or RDI, which some have called colloquially the torture program. You take pains to make clear that this was not a unilateral CIA action, rather one that was authorized by President George W. Bush and cleared by the Justice Department. Still, you had reservations. Why? Uh, 
The CIA, when it carries out any type of covert action program, it does so, as you point out, not as a rogue organization, but at the direction of the President of the United States. And these programs have to be determined to be lawful by uh, the highest uh, legal advisory body in the executive branch, which is the Office of Legal Counsel and Department of Justice. And so that rendition detention interrogation program had those qualities to it. It was also briefed to the senior leadership of the Congress. So uh, the CIA um, was authorized to carry out that program. And so the program was determined at the time to be lawful and legal and not to be torture. Um, but I think um, making sure that a, a program is lawful is the, the minimum standard that's required. But also I think it's important and incumbent upon CIA officers, up to and include the leadership of the CIA, to ensure that the, what the CIA is doing is not just lawful, but also is ethical, is principled, is moral, and is consistent with the values of the United States of America. Now, those qualities in terms of ethics and principles and values and morals are subjective. Uh, and so different people can have different perspectives about whether or not something is moral or something is uh, an American value. And so I felt, uh, and I was not in the chain of command at the time, um, I did not have any oversight, responsibility, or even detailed knowledge of the covert action program. But I was a very senior officer at CIA. And I felt that when I learned about some of the details of what was being done, including the, the very graphic uh, details of waterboarding, uh, I felt a great revulsion. And I, I felt that that's something that the CIA, nor any American organization, should be doing. I expressed my concerns to several people, but I didn't bang my fist on the table. I didn't you know, engage in a campaign to try to get it stopped. Because again, when I think about the CIA's role and the fact that it is uh, legally um, uh, bound to, to carry out uh, you know, the duly authorized directives and orders, I, I had to grapple with this dilemma that I was part of an organization that was engaged in this type of activity. But uh, I decided that I was not going to you know, really cause... You know, problems. Um, and so I put my head down and I did my work because mm. the agency was involved in so many important activities at the time to prevent a recurrence of that horrific 9-11 attack, as well as so many other things. And my job was to ensure that uh, the CIA programs and offices had sufficient budget and personnel and logistic support and other types of things that they needed. So I, I, I guess I just um, rationalized in my own mind that uh, I could continue with the CIA, which I wanted to do. I never considered retiring or resigning. Uh, I did feel that the overall CIA mission was critically important to the, the, the national security interests of the United States. It's an amazing level of introspection there. Um, you, you wrote that your failure to clearly voice your concerns to Director Tenet was your most most egregious sin of omission. Do you, do you think it would have made a difference if you had voiced your concerns more clearly? Um, I, I don't know. Um, there is no one um, who has been more influential in my career, uh, nor more of a mentor or role model than George Tenet. He, I think, embodies just so much uh, spirit, uh, vision, as well as commitment to this country. And so George and I have been, you know, friends and colleagues uh, for the past several decades. Um, I felt that, you know, George was just involved in so many things. There were so many things going on at the time. Um, and I felt that the CIA senior leadership supporting George uh, should have spent more time thinking through this issue, the implications, the, the longer term implications of this program. Uh, they owed it, and I owed it to George. Uh, I don't know whether or not it would have made a, a difference, because again, the program was legal. Uh, it was, it was something that a lot of people considered absolutely essential, uh, mm -hmm. because Al Qaeda, in the minds of many, um, posed an existential threat to the United States at the time. There were second and third wave of the waves of attack that were planned and were ready to go. But if not for the good work of CIA and other agencies and departments, and, as well as foreign partners those attacks would have led to countless more lives being lost. So it's easy for some who can look back in Monday morning quarterbacking and 2020 hindsight vision and say, you never should have done that. Or, 
Um, but uh, I just feel that my role at the time, I should have been more outspoken. I you should were chief have. of staff? Remind me. No, at the time I was the deputy chief operating officer of the agency, oh, the deputy okay. executive director. Uh, so I was a senior official. I was part of the senior executive right. team. Uh, so I don't know what it made a difference. You know, I, could I have rallied more support within the agency to putting, you know, opposing it? But again, it was in a program authorized by the president of the United States, briefed to Congress and, and deemed lawful. So, uh, you know, the, these are issues that I think CI officers throughout the years, uh, many, many have had to deal with and to come to terms with. And there were CI officers who refused to participate in that program because it was inconsistent with their personal values and good on them. Um, so there are institutional values and morals and ethics, and then there are personal ones. And so, as I said in the book, I, I do believe that I fell short at the time, and I committed to never again um, keeping my <laughs> my tongue quiet. And maybe that's also contributed why. Maybe I'm committing more sins of commission now than <laughs> sins of omission. <laughs> okay. Let's let's come forward to the present for a minute here. Um, last Friday, Iran's top nuclear scientist was assassinated, uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. U.S. officials say privately, no question, Israel is behind it. You condemned the killing on Twitter, calling it criminal, criminal and highly reckless and risks retaliation and a new round of regional conflict. Putting on your analysts had. Do you think that Iran will retaliate or do you think it will refrain in order to work with Biden, President-elect Joe Biden on getting back to the Iran nuclear deal? And, and, and how much more difficult has the assassination made it for Biden to re-engage? Well, those series of <laughs> important <laughs> questions there. Um, I think it does make it uh, more challenging for Joe Biden to return uh, at least uh, immediately to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was the international agreement that the United States and other Security Council members, along with uh, Germany and the EU, had agreed to. Um, I, whether will Iran retaliate or will it, you know, um, try to restrain itself? I think it's going to do both. <laughs> it sounds kind of you know strange, but the Iranian parliament just within the last few days uh, passed a law uh, saying that uh, Iran is going to um, return to um, enriching uranium above the 4% level up to 20%, uh, which is just a, you know, a step away from you know, highly enriched uranium that can be used for the development of a nuclear warhead. It says that it's going to restrict access to certain types of facilities as well. Whether or not it's going to be able to implement those things in the near term, it's unclear. But I do think uh, that is in you know, partial or large measure a response to the, the killing of Fakhrizia Day. Um, I, I do think that uh, that act was reckless. Uh, I do think it unnecessarily um, provoked um, uh, an Iranian, uh, at least rhetorical at this time, you know, uh, response that could lead to an escalation of tensions and could lead to some type of conflict. The, the killing uh, in no way materially affects the Iranian nuclear program. Fakhrizadeh day was the, the the father of the the nuclear weapons program that uh, never you know was able to come to fruition uh, so w was it designed to in fact uh, try to prevent uh, a return to that uh, nuclear arms agreement and very well might have been the, the principal motivation mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to set back the Iranian program itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, again, I don't know who carried out or who authorized the killing, but it certainly bears the, the hallmarks of a, of a killing that uh, you know, has been attributed in the past to Israel. And if indeed it was Israel, how likely is it that uh, it, Israel would have carried off such an act without alerting the United States or getting some sign of approval from the United States, in your view? Well, uh, it's clear that uh, the relationship between the, uh, the Netanyahu administration and the Trump administration is very, very close. And um, I don't know whether or not those details would have been shared. Um, those um, plans would not have been shared during the Obama administration. There are press reports that there were Iranian scientists killed uh, during the Obama administration. If those reports are true, uh, you can be assured that the Obama administration, including myself, would have registered our deep objections to the Israelis immediately. Uh, so um, it, whether or not they, they discussed it with the, you know, the United States, it is kind of curious uh, and coincidental 
that uh, a few days prior to that killing, that there was this meeting between Secretary Pompeo, Bibi Netanyahu, and Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't think that uh, Netanyahu would have uh, shared uh, details of a specific act like that, but he might have said, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we have some things planned to uh, hit, you know, hurt Iran or to make the return to the nuclear agreement more more difficult, which would have been music to the ears of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, I'm sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, President Trump's attacks on the intelligence community have, among other things, lowered morale in the agencies. How big a job will President-elect Biden and his new DNI, Avril Haines, a former deputy of yours, if she is confirmed, how much? How big a job will they have in repairing the damage done internally and the damage to the relationship between the White House and the community? Well, I, I know that there is a deep disappointment <clears throat> inside of CIA that uh, Donald Trump has denigrated and disparaged uh, the professionals in the intelligence community as well as their work. And a greater disappointment that he is not using the intelligence uh, to keep America safe. That said, um, I have tremendous uh, respect uh, and admiration for CIA officers who continue to do their job to the best of their ability despite the challenges, despite the criticisms that they have faced. And CIA officers over the years, and CIA has been a target of criticism from all quarters. And so it's not as though it's that unusual. It's unusual that a sitting president of the United States of America would do something like that. So that's what's, I think, very dismaying, disappointing to so many. But um, I think morale um, among CIA officers remains strong even in these difficult times because they know the importance of their work. They know what they do is critically important to our national security. The, I am concerned, though, that uh, the morale of family members, the ones who have to support their loved ones who deploy overseas quickly or spend long, long days and nights in the office or as well as um, young Americans who may have been interested in pursuing a career at CIA and decided because of the disparaging remarks of the commander-in-chief about intelligence that they just said, well, why should I do that? You know, the work is not appreciated or recognized or, mm. or, or useful. So um, I, I do believe that the Biden administration is going to send strong signals, both inside of the intelligence community and more broadly, that intelligence is critically important to this country's national security. And the intelligence professionals deserve our praise, our admiration, and our appreciation. And so it's going to be, I think, a, a new day for them. Uh, let's, let's sure hope so. But is there any way to prevent uh, what some see as, as the politicization of what should historically, uh, what should be and historically has been a nonpartisan, a political intelligence community? In other words, are there guardrails that can be constructed to restrain a president who might be set on installing appointees who will do his political bidding in in violation of norms. If you at one point had suggested maybe seven year terms for say a CIA. (laughs) Well, yeah, when I was CIA director, uh, we had draft up legislation uh, and sent it to the white house uh, to consider having the CIA director serve a, you know, a, a term that is not going to be determined by the presidential election cycle. So it could be a five or seven year term or whatever. Um, I thought that would give greater uh, certainty to uh, a CIA director um, surviving through multiple you know, administrations. But we look at what Donald Trump did with Jim Comey and the FBI director serves a 10 year term as well, but he was summarily fired by Donald Trump. So what are the guardrails? Well, I think our founding fathers and, and you know, our um, um, elected officials over the years, quite frankly, never anticipated that we'd have somebody of Donald Trump's ilk and his um, craven, I think, political um, approach to the job and his, his corruption uh, in the Oval Office. And so I... I I think you know one of the best guardrails is to not elect such individuals and to elect people of in- integrity and of competence um, who are not going to um, politicize the institutions of government the way he has with intelligence uh, and his appointment of individuals who have been rather 
um, accommodating, and <laughs> the most charitable term I can use, mm-hmm. to Donald Trump's personal wishes. So when he appoints people like uh, Rich Grinnell as the acting director of national intelligence and John Radcliffe, the director of national intelligence now, and then the Senate confirms these individuals in these uh, positions, uh, I, I think if, if people want to try to uh, politicize the institution of the government, they can find a way to do that. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I think uh, it's, it comes down to leadership and those individuals who take seriously their oath of office when they swear that oath of allegiance uh, to fulfill the responsibilities and duties that they are going to assume. Uh, that's what is the, uh, the greatest, I think, you know, assurance that we're going to have uh, people of integrity. I am very glad that people like Chris Ray are standing firm. Um, and Chris Krebs, who was the head of the cybersecurity uh, agency, um, stood firm and, and again was uh, fired. Uh, so uh, the fact that there are so many enablers of Donald Trump uh, in the executive branch as well as in the Congress really has unfortunately been a, a most imperfect storm. <laughs> I wanted to take advantage of your expertise in the Middle East a little bit and, and, look, and explore again some of the um, episodes in your book. So the Arab Spring began a decade ago when a Tunisian street vendor set himself on fire to protest corruption and it spread across the Middle East. And many in the White House thought that democracy was going to take hold in the region. You cautioned your colleagues that these rebellions could lead to authoritarian crackdowns or a power vacuum exploited by terrorists. And you were right. What was the single largest mistake, do you think, made by the Obama administration in handling the Arab Spring as it spread across the region? Well, you know, the the Arab Spring, which was manifest in in a number of countries throughout the Middle East, Mm -hmm. they each had their own set of conditions, circumstances, and phenomena that I think shaped the course of the developments. Um, And there weren't a lot of good options for the Obama administration at that time. When I think about what was happening in Egypt, and the throngs of people who had gathered in the streets and calling for Mubarak's ouster. And Mubarak's continuation in, in, in the presidency was, uh, was untenable. And so I think the Obama administration rightly tried to facilitate that transition from Mubarak to something else. But uh, so many of these Arab states lack the, the political institutions, uh, the, the government institutions that are necessary in order to move along this path of democratization. And uh, they were just, I think, rife and ripe for um, exploitation by those individuals who wanted to take advantage of, you know, the, the opportunities that uh, presented themselves, uh, not to advance democracy, but to advance their own personal or political interests. So um, were there mistakes? Um, yes, uh, from the standpoint of um, I think we should have been, uh, I don't know, a, a bit more um, patient, a bit more um, understanding of the underlying complexities in these societies and cultures and politics. And um, uh, elections in and of themselves do not make a democratic system. And I think there was an overwhelming focus and emphasis on carrying out elections without thinking through what is really needed in the aftermath of an election and even before an election in order to try to maximize the, the potential for democratic, incremental democratic progress to be made. Um, and so, uh, again, democracy is a journey. It's a process. It's not a light switch that you turn on and off with an election. And I think there needed to be, I think, a greater understanding and appreciation of that, which required a lot more attention and investment, I think, in those other elements of the democratization process. You've done two tours in Saudi Arabia and know the kingdom well. You were close to Mohammed bin Nayef, who was the interior minister and then crown prince until he was displaced by Mohammed bin Salman, the son of King Salman. President like Joe Biden has criti- has criticized the kingdom for its human rights abuses, the humanitarian cost of its war in Yemen, and said he would treat the Saudis like quote the pariah they are. 
How far can the Biden administration go in pressing the kingdom to change its ways without risking American national interests, do you think? Well, I think just like you know, countries such as Iran or China or Russia, you know, Saudi Arabia is not a monolith. Um, there are important people, very influential people, but then there are dynamics uh, within the government and within the, the country that I think we have to be mindful of. I believe it's important for the United States and Saudi Arabia to have a very good, close, and working relationship for a variety of reasons. Uh, not just because of oil, but there are important geostrategic issues as well as issues related to uh, Saudi Arabia plays an important role in the Middle East, indeed in, on the global stage. Uh, so I think we want to try to encourage Saudi Arabia to um, move along the path of, of modernization, of democratization, and, and to fulfill its, its responsibilities as a sovereign state. And unfortunately, Mohammed bin Salman is a very mixed bag. Um, he has brought some important reforms to Saudi Arabia. He has opened up the society and helped to bring Saudi Arabia into the 21st century. At the same time, though, he does it according to his plan, and he does not brook any opposition or criticism, and he has cracked down very hard on, on critics, real and perceived. And Mohammed Salman was responsible, certainly in my mind, for the horrific killing and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, the, uh, the opinion writer for the Washington Post, um, who in a Saudi consulate in Turkey was horrifically murdered. And I, I do think it's important for the Biden administration to make it quite clear to the Saudi government and to Mohammed Salman that, again, it's a new day in Washington, uh, that the United States is not going to turn a blind eye to these types of things. There are political activists who have been incarcerated and maltreated in Saudi Arabia today, including women activists, uh, because Mohammed Salman continues to suppress and oppress individuals in Saudi Arabia that have the audacity to challenge uh, him. And uh, the Saudi Arabia's continuation of the, this military campaign in Yemen that has led to untold numbers of casualties and just impoverishment and destruction of that beautiful country. Uh, so I, I do think that the Biden administration is going to have a very candid <laughs> and unambiguous conversation with Saudi officials. And um, until there is, I think, a, uh, a reckoning of what happened with Jamal Khashoggi, you know, they have, you know, supposedly carried out some of these, you know, ghost trials. Nobody has really sort of seen what has happened. And some of the, the perpetrators of this have been given a, a full pass. So I, I do think the Biden administration is going to put some conditions on a return to business as, as usual between the United States and Saudi Arabia. They can take actions. They can cut off all but the most critical types of, you know, intelligence sharing, as well as military assistance, as well as other technical types of assistance, uh, and make it very clear that what took place uh, in the past several years under Mohammed Salman's uh, direction is intolerable and uh, needs to be addressed. For me, one of the most interesting parts of your book, John, had to do with the Russian interference campaign that emerged in 2016, something I covered in real time. The intelligence community went from being caught off guard to obtaining some pretty exquisite intelligence in a matter of months. Can you recount the arc of that learning curve? Can you tell us a little bit about how you, over time, came to understand what Russia was up to? Well, uh, the intelligence community and law enforcement communities know that Russia has tried to interfere in U.S. elections for many, many decades um, mm -hmm. with traditional propaganda. Um, the with the advent of the of the digital domain uh, and the explosion in social media, there is just so many more opportunities now for the Russians to propagate its uh, information, disinformation, misinformation. And um, so as the 2016 election season was uh, coming, um, we were, you know, looking for uh, what Russia was going to do. In the spring of 2016, it became increasingly clear. Uh, the, the barometric conditions, if you will, uh, started to point in a direction of a very intense, broad, deep uh, effort on the part of the Russians. Um, and what was different about it, a couple of things were different about it. We had intelligence that indicated that Vladimir Putin had personally directed the intelligence service to do this. And secondly, it clearly was designed to try to hurt Hillary Clinton and to help Donald Trump. 
The Russians believed that Hillary was going to be elected. They believed the Poles at the time as well. Uh, and they were trying to basically bloody her uh, so that she would become president in a, in a damaged fashion so that the next president of the United States would be weaker on the world stage. But when Donald Trump then started to go through the Republican primaries in scorched earth fashion and became the Republican candidate, they saw that you know he actually had a chance to become president. And so it was a clear effort on the part of the Russians to try to help his election. And uh, in the July time frame, um, as I became aware of some things and CIA offices were bringing things to my attention, I dug deep. I guess I was going back to my analytic roots uh, and spent days just pouring over all of the information and intelligence that was available to me. And that's when I decided that I needed to go down urgently to the White House and tell President Obama, uh, National Security Advisor Rice and others, what we were seeing, and then also to tell the, con the leadership of the Congress that this was an effort that was um, unprecedented, and again, in terms of scale mm -hmm. and scope. Uh, they were hacking into computers. They were releasing emails in a, in a design that to be damaging. And we didn't know what else they were planning to do in the run-up to the election. Were they going to try? We saw that they were navigating into the electoral infrastructure mm. in several states. Might they try to adjust the, the tallies, do the types of things that uh, Donald Trump is, is fraudulently claiming now uh, happened in the 2020 election? Mm. Might they try to send money into you know, one of the other campaigns, send it into Trump through various you know, cutouts, or send it into the Clinton campaign and uh, be, have it be tainted so that, again, it uh, disparages her. So there were a lot of things that we had seen the Russians do over time in other elections, particularly in Europe, that we thought that they might do in the United States. So uh, we were, it, it came as a bit of a, a quickly brewing storm, um, even though we knew that uh, it was going to rain uh, in terms of Russian propaganda. We just didn't expect the, the intensity and scope of it to, uh, to be what it was. Yeah, and you talk a little bit now about some of the, the factors that were going through your mind and that, that I imagine weighed um, on, against coming out publicly and naming Russia and blaming Russia um, earlier on. You finally did it in October, October 6th or 7th, I guess it was. Do you think now that was the right move? Do you think you should have, knowing what you know, come out publicly sooner and maybe imposed some consequences sooner than you mm -hmm. did? It's a, it's a very legitimate question. It wasn't really a secret that Russia was behind these things uh, because it was widely reported by your paper and other papers about who was responsible for the hacks. Uh, so uh, I think uh, President Obama was really trying to ensure that he was not going to be seen as using the office of the presidency to help his favorite candidate, Hillary Clinton, and hurt the Republican candidate, Donald Trump. And so I think there was a reluctance to be more forceful. And there were efforts to try to get a, a bipartisan uh, statement from the Congress, from the Senate. And Mitch McConnell and others were opposed to doing something like that. So I think Barack Obama was, was really careful. Maybe some people would say to a fault uh, that wasn't more um, um, assertive in terms of what was going to be said publicly. Uh, we had braced Russian officials privately. You know, I did so, uh, Obama did so, Susan Rice and, and others. And there was that public statement by Jim Clapper and Jay Johnson in October. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's, it's unknowable, but I wonder whether or not those, those strong messages that we sent to them privately dissuaded them from doing more. Because we made it quite clear that there were consequences to their interference and they would feel the wrath of the United States if they did that. And did it give them, you know, a second thought about, well, maybe we shouldn't, you know, start to muck around more. So they continued their, their social media efforts and campaign. But let's not forget, they also had someone like Paul Manafort who was providing them data about, you know, uh, certain uh, precincts in certain swing states that was useful for them to try to direct some of their propaganda efforts. So I, again, it was a, uh, there were just so many things that were going on at the time that again, we can look back and in hindsight and say we should have done this or that. But I think that we, we, we tr certainly tried to handle it the best we could, again, without politicizing the process.
Thank you. I want to ask you one more question before we move to um, audience questions. But I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask you. But let me move to this one. This is something you feel very passionately about, which is the need for diversity in the ranks of the intelligence community. You walked the halls of the CIA with your rainbow lanyard in support of the LGBTQ community. Why is that so important? Why is diversity so important in the intelligence world? And what can the next administration do to improve on it? I can think of no other institution or profession that uh, really is so dependent on diversity in order to achieve mission success than is the CIA. The CIA is supposed to be this country's eyes and ears around the globe. All of those countries, all of those cultures and societies and ethnicities and languages and religions. And the more that we can tap into the melting pot that exists here in the United States, that is derived from all of those locations and societies and, and places around the world, the, the better able we are to operate overseas. At one point, I was pretty good in Arabic, but if I would wander down, you know, which I did among the tribes in southern, southwestern Saudi Arabia near the border with Yemen, as good as my Arabic might be, I still didn't look like a local. I still didn't understand the culture the way I needed to. So again, I, I think from a business case, you can make a exceptionally strong case for CIA officers to be that diverse reflection of the United States as well as of the world. But also, it's the, it's the right thing to do. And there are some personal experiences of my own that really, I think, motivated me to take this very seriously. I think there were times growing up in New Jersey when I didn't uh, speak out when I should have, when I heard you know, uh, comments, uh, negative, pejorative comments about others. Uh, I was part of that, that group that, you know, snickered, whatever. But also when I was in CIA, I, I saw the, the, the real struggle and pain that some of my fellow CIA officers were going through when they were uh, hiding their sexual orientation because it would have spelled a disaster and they, basically an end to their career. Um, if they were exposed. And so I just felt a personal as well as an institutional obligation to ensure that people of all colors, religions, sexual orientation, you know, ethnic, linguistic, whatever background, see the CIA as a place of rich opportunity where everybody can advance uh, based on merit and that there's going to be no inhibition or no obstacle to advancement because of who somebody is. And so I was very pleased that uh, along with uh, senior leaders of the CIA, we made it a real serious effort. Uh, building upon the very good work I think that my predecessors did. And I'm not taking you know, credit for this. this. These are things that are done over time. And just like democratization in the, in the Middle East, you know, the diversity and inclusion is something that takes time and re requires a sustained effort over time, especially from leadership. Okay, and you expect President Biden's uh, team to continue that effort? Well, yes. Well, first of all, if you look at the composition of it, uh, it is a reflection of the diversity. And I know, like my former deputy at CIA, Avril Haines, who has been nominated to be the director of national intelligence, she is a very, very strong advocate of diversity and inclusion. And, and others whom, with whom I have worked previously and who are part of the Biden team uh, feel very strongly about it. So it's not going to be lip service. They're going to walk the talk. And uh, I think you're going to see some real positive movement on this front. In fact, one of the questions we're getting from the audience is, what do you think about President-elect Biden's intelligence team, and what's one piece of advice you'd give them for the journey ahead? I think a lot. The only person who has been nominated at the point is uh, Avril Haines, um, and I can't say enough good things about her intellect, about her commitment, her work ethic, you know, all of the... Uh, Joe Biden is somebody who understands intelligence and uh, respects it and values it, depends on it. Uh, and so I know that it's going to have, you know, a very, very important place in the Biden administration. The challenges that they face, I think, are going to be many as the Biden administration tries to implement its policy vision uh, across the world uh, to ensure that they're able to uh, provide uh, the policymakers, you know, Tony Blinken as Sec uh, Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan as the National Security Advisor, provide the insights, the analysis, the intelligence that they need in order to make wise decisions about how we're going to reassert you know, the U.S. leadership role on the world stage, what we can do to ensure that if we're repairing the relationship in some way with Iran on the 
on the nuclear arms deal that we're not going to be blindsided by some of these Iranian radicals and extremists who are determined to uh, do what they can to cause instability in the region. So the, the challenge for in the intelligence community leadership is that there are so many things that the United States is involved in around the world, from terrorism to proliferation to big power relationships. Uh, they have to deal with all these things simultaneously, and they have to allocate resources so that um, they're going to be able to give the appropriate attention to all of these different areas. Yes, but in, in fact, in reality, they can't give exact equal amounts to each each relationship or, or threat at the same time. You've mentioned great power uh, competition. Uh, yeah, there's also climate change and the continuing pandemic. How do you rack and stack the the, the threats and the foreign policy challenges that President-elect Biden is inheriting? And, and specifically, how different will his approach be, do you think, from that of President Trump versus China, non-China, and Russia? Um, a couple points. One is that at the beginning of each new administration, uh, they go through a process called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, which is to rack and stack uh, all of the priorities uh, from a policy perspective so that the intelligence community can use that framework so that they can allocate their resources, their capabilities accordingly. So I, I, I do think that the Biden administration is going to go, go through that. But uh, Joe Biden, and I worked very closely with him for eight years, um, he is a very practical, pragmatic, and centrist <laughs> uh, uh, leader who looks at these issues in a non-ideological fashion and so, for example, dealing with China, he recognizes that there are many dimensions to the U.S.-China relationship. There's trade, there's economics, there's proliferation, there's cyber, there is you know, the big power of human rights, there's, uh, there's uh, primacy in the, the Western Pacific, you know, the South China, East China Sea. There, there are many, many different dimensions to it. In some areas, I think Joe Biden and the team are going to recognize that there are areas for cooperation. What can we do with, with China to try to um, address North Korea's nuclear capability? You know, China is not really pleased with what Kim Jong-un has been doing. Uh, and there are areas where we're going to be re reaching some type of accommodation. There will be areas of tension and also areas of, of confrontation. So unlike a Donald Trump who tends to be absolutist in some of his approaches and characterizations, I think the, the Biden team is really going to try to dissect those dimensions and not just lump everything into confrontation. <laughs> and the same thing is true with Russia. Uh, I think, uh, you know, honest, Donald Trump has, you know, had a very good relationship with Vladimir Putin. He claims that he's tougher on Russia than anybody else. Well, it's because of pressure from Congress. Congress and from others that he has been or has had to be. But the Biden administration, I think, is going to look for ways to have a constructive dialogue with, with Russia on, for example, arms reduction talks and other types of things where we really need to engage in a constructive way with, with Russia. But that doesn't mean we're going to ignore what Russia is doing in Ukraine or in Belarus or other areas. And so, again, this is going to be this pragmatic, measured um, approach to these issues and challenges because the Biden team recognizes the complexity of these issues. Same thing with Iran. Iran is not an evil empire monolith. It's not. There are many different components to Iran. And so the way to, I think, address these problems in a constructive way is, again, to understand some of the underlying factors and to see whether or not we can leverage some of the influence the capabilities uh, that we have in order to move things in a more positive direction. Okay, um, we have another question here that says, public service is probably one of the most needed elements in the formation of our youth to attain a, a feeling of common purpose, responsibility, and destiny. Hard question. Do you agree? <laughs> well, ab absolutely. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, talking with universities and colleges, and I'm affiliated with my two alma maters, Fordham University in New York and the University of Texas at Austin. And just over the past couple of weeks, I've had many seminars, uh, participating in seminars with students and trying to, again, talk about what it means to be an intelligence professional in national security. And uh, really trying to encourage them to think seriously about these professions. Because I do believe that 
we, we are an exceptional country. I believe in, in American exceptionalism, not because we're better or smarter or bigger than anybody else. It's because we've had exceptional good fortune in terms of this country with bountiful natural resources, arable land, navigable rivers, long sea coast, the melting pot of the world. No other country has had all these benefits. And so as a result of this exceptional good fortune, I think we have exceptional responsibilities on the global stage. And I do think more Americans should recognize that we, the United States, are part of this global system. And yes, we have to ensure that our people are protected, are well-fed, are taken care of. Yes, unfortunately, the mantra of America first, America first has been shrill on the ears of so many people around the world mm -hmm. who believe the United States is using its muscularity and its power to advance itself at the cost of others. And I do think that the Biden administration is going to send a different signal. And I think it's important for young Americans who are looking at public service. They should be thinking about how that they're going to uh, spend some time in their life for the betterment of not just their fellow citizens, but for the betterment of, of humankind. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question that sort of meshes with one I wanted to ask you, so I'll ask it like this. Uh, talking a little bit about emerging threats, the coronavirus pandemic and climate change are threats to national and global security. How must the intelligence community adapt to confront those threats, do you think? Yeah, pandemics, uh, climate change, you mentioned before, uh, and some of these other areas that are sort of non-traditional intelligence areas. Uh, these phenomena really fundamentally affect um, the, the world uh, in terms of government's ability to um, grapple with these problems, uh, address them. Uh, it has uh, impact on the political, economic, and social fronts. Um, as uh, governments can be weakened as a result of uh, pandemics, as well as with climate change, as the, the, the coastal seas rise and they reclaim coastal communities and, and these uh, populations have to move inland or across borders and, and increase migration flows, these all have security implications. And so what CIA and other intelligence community professionals need to do is to look at these phenomena that may have you know, a longer gestation periods um, and understand how they are going to affect United States national security interests as well as international security. And again, thinking about, uh, we're going to you know, uh, get a handle on, on COVID-19, certainly, but it's not going to be the, next, the last pandemic. You know, what lessons can, have we learned uh, and other countries have learned that can be incorporated into better preparedness and planning for the future? What uh, are we learning about uh, climate change in terms of the effect on, on um, <clears throat> agriculture, on economies, on employment, on migration uh, that we really need to be considering? Because the effects of some of these things are much more insidious and much, much less visible and less urgent. And CIA officers in particular have to be worried certainly about the wolf at the door, but they worry about the wolf down the street and the wolf in the next neighborhood. Because if they're coming to you, you know, if you wait until they're at the door, then your options are more, much more limited. And that's where I think the, the CIA and others, I think, have been rightly criticized in the past for not uh, looking sufficiently at the over-the-horizon challenges that ultimately are going to come to our shores. And that's where I think the leadership of CIA as well as the leadership of the Biden administration really needs to be thinking about what are those near-term, medium-term, and longer-term threats and challenges as well as opportunities that we need to work on. Okay, maybe a couple more questions here. Um, what, there were an, great concerns that Russia might attempt to, to you know, do a repeat of 2016 this year. And in fact, it didn't materialize. And uh, and though we were very concerned about foreign interference and foreign disinformation and misinformation, it turned out that domestic disinformation and misinformation, often fueled by the president himself, was the greatest threat to the election. How do you think about that, John? And how do you think in the the, what's the most effective way to deter or build resilience in the American public against Inf disinformation threats, whether they be from Russia and, or China or the White House? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the professionals in the, in the government did a great job uh, to prepare 
uh, for the 2020 election and to make it more difficult for actors, whether they be domestic or foreign, to interfere technically in the election systems. I do think there, there was still you know, misinformation, disinformation that went out there, but also the I brain, think- not of the machines. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, the influence operations. But right. I do think that the social media platforms and the leadership of them, the Zuckerbergs and Dorseys and others, were much more um, humble as well as aware this time that their platforms were being exploited. So I think they took steps. But the question is a very valid one, especially in the digital environment. What, what can the government do to monitor and to try to uh, prevent the propagation of misinformation, disinformation, especially when it's a lot of that propagation is coming from the senior most government officials in the United States. You know, I, I understand that hyperbole is something that goes along with politics, but outright lies, specious allegations, I've never seen anything uh, like I've seen in the past, you know, several years. And so I, I think... As a society, we need to ask ourselves a question, how are we going to um, try to ensure the continuation of freedom of speech, particularly in a digital environment, but at the same time, safeguard our, our security <laughs> and the integrity of uh, our societies and our, you know, the, that digital environment? What is the role of the FBI and CIA and NSA in that digital domain to monitor, <laughs> to check, to thwart? <laughs> efforts. And it, it, freedom of speech does not mean just, you know, freedom to put out facts. It means to freedom to say what you want. Um, you know, there, there are certain limits to that. You can't go into a theater, a crowded theater, and, you know, yell fire because you endanger folks. Well, I do think that, you know, the next administration, future administrations, as well as the Congress, really needs to be thinking about what are we going to do to try to prevent just the wholesale kidnapping <laughs> of the, that digital environment in our minds by those who want to put out disinformation and to mislead us? That's why it's not surprising at all that so many people, you know, believe, you know, the very malicious and false accusations be made, including us myself, you know, they're... At times that, you know, my wife looks on Twitter or something and she says, oh my goodness, you know, what the, I didn't know you did that. I said, well, I didn't do that. <laughs> but it, it, it gains traction. And um, again, it's, it's not an easy issue uh, to address, but I, I do think we need to do it in a much more systemic and strategic fashion. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's maybe the biggest challenge, one of the biggest confronting us in the next five years. Uh, if I have a couple of minutes left, I just had some questions about your writing of the book that I, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, for instance, President Trump, through an executive order, essentially denied you access to your CIA notes and files to help you research your memoir, something the agency had done for previous directors. Mm -hmm. How did that affect the substance of your book? Are there anecdotes and episodes that you would have included had you had such access? Yeah, um, yeah I wasn't able to access any of my files the way previous directors who wrote memoirs were able to. Um, I, I had the, you know, I have a pretty good memory. I was also able to talk to some <laughs> former agency, you know, employees and former colleagues of mine to help me recollect certain things. Um, and, and even if I had access to those files, I still would have had to submit my manuscript for a review by the agency to ensure that no classified information would have been contained in my memoir. But I think if I had the opportunity to review them, it would have stimulated my memory and recollections about maybe meetings I had or conversations I had or, or events or whatever. So, um, you know, I, I thought it was really going to prevent me from completing the memoir. Um, and so there were several times when I was writing this that I, I was ready to throw down my pen or throw away my computer and say, I can't do this. It's just too hard. But then the challenge was, uh, what should I limit my my discussion to? Because in the course of 33 plus government years uh, that I was in the government, uh, you know, I had to decide what I wanted to write about. And I felt when I was doing this like I was in a plane at 35,000 feet going over the course of my 33-year career and deciding what should I come down to 10,000 feet to talk about? What should I come down to 1,000 feet? And what should I come to street level? And it, it was, uh, I had to make some decisions. Uh, so if I had access to my files, I think I would have had more decisions <laughs> to make about the types of things to include. But 
there was uh, a lot more that I think I, I could have said, and uh, I am in the process of thinking about writing a, another another ah, book, sequel. Not, not, a, not a memoir, but one that's more analytical and, and talks about the, the challenges that I think our country will face in the, in the years ahead. Yeah, we, you know, you, you say you have a good memory. I mean, I think it's phenomenal. You remembered the exact date uh, that you left uh, to fly to Jakarta uh, back when you were a what, freshman or sophomore in college and then the flight number of your trip to Cairo. The well, I've kept year. a lot of records, personal records, too. So I was able to go through some, you know, things that I had and I was able to pull out the plane tickets, you know, the receipts from you know, my plane travel in 1974 and 1975. So it was that was helpful that I had my own sort of stash of, of files. Talk about a pack rat. You've kept all of your plane tickets <laughs> yeah. from 74. It's all unclassified. It's all my stuff. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. Well, uh, I guess we are now, uh, I guess, out of time. But I wanted to just give our thanks to you, John, uh, for, for sharing with us today and uh, for writing this book, Undaunted, which I highly recommend to everyone out there. And uh, to thank our audience with Commonwealth Club, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Ellen Nakashima. Thank you. Thank you, John. Everyone stay safe. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, everybody, for listening. And, and uh, I just want to just one moment to say uh, to uh, everybody listening and all American citizens that the work that is done by the CIA professionals, as well as other professionals in the intelligence, law enforcement, diplomatic and military communities, uh, it's these are your fellow citizens that are imperfect beings. Uh, they make mistakes, but they try uh, every day to do what they can to keep this great country of ours safe and secure. And so I'm sure that uh, throughout the course of your life, you might have met somebody who had worked for the CIA but couldn't acknowledge it because so many of our CIA professionals work in the shadows and, and cannot acknowledge uh, their uh, organizational affiliation. But uh, I think you should rest more assured at night that uh, they are working on your behalf uh, around the globe 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. So again, thank you, Ellen. Thank you for the Com- to the Commonwealth Club for this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, national security and intelligence.